with wet AMD, people were going blind quickly and you could see the improvements on OCT and you could see the improvements on visual acuity. Welcome to ICANN, a podcast about ophthalmology through a uniquely Canadian lens with Dr. Cedare Ziai and myself, Dr. Guillermo Rocha. This season, we have two new co-hosts joining us, Dr. Mona Dagger and Dr. Hadi Saheb. They'll be hosting upcoming episodes throughout the season. Season three of the ICANN podcast is brought to you by Bayer Ophthalmology. Thank you for your support. On this episode of ICANN, we're pleased to introduce our listeners to Dr. David Brown, Clinical Professor of Ophthalmology, Cullen Eye Institute, Baylor College of Medicine, and Vice Chair for Research at the Blanton Eye Institute, Houston Methodist Hospital. Dr. Brown is the Director of Research at Retina Consultants of Texas, and he chairs the Medical Leadership Board of Retina Consultants of America. He also serves on the RCA Board of Directors. Dr. Brown graduated from Baylor College of Medicine with highest honors and completed ophthalmology and retina training at the University of Iowa, where he was a Thomas Heat Fellow, a Herman Knapp Fellow, and was awarded the Ron Michaels Fellowship Award, presented to the top retinal surgery fellow in the U.S. in 1994. Dr. Brown is an elected member of the Macula Society, the Retina Society, and the club Jules Gonin and his honors include the American Academy of Ophthalmology Honor Award, the American Society of Retina Specialists Honor Award, the ASRS Senior Honor Award, the AAO Senior Honor Award, Retina Hall of Fame Inaugural Inductee, and continuous selection as one of the best doctors in America from 2007 to 2022, and Texas Superdocs from 2009 to 2022. Dr. Brown's research and clinical interests are focused on macular surgery, age-related macular degeneration, gene therapy, retinal vascular disease, and diabetic retinopathy. He has published and written over 400 national meeting presentations, abstracts, and scientific papers, including many of the primary papers establishing the use of anti-VGF agents for AMD, retinal vein occlusion, and diabetic retinopathy. As if this wasn't enough, Dr. Brown also serves as the consultant retina specialist for NASA for all ongoing and long-term spaceflight astronauts. Dr. Brown, welcome to the ICANN podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks so much. So I'll get started with um, some of the aspects that we mentioned in the introduction, and we're hearing a lot about new retina therapies in development. For example, a Fliber set, uh, gene therapy, depot implants, etc. I thought we were all done with just the injections that our retina colleagues do, and that was that, but it seems like the field is expanding. Can you tell us more? And what is the rationale behind these new therapies, David? Sure. So when we started... Uh the anti-VEGF trials, literally over 20 years ago, 2002, they were amazing, like beyond expectations. These patients that went blind every time, maybe you could laser and make a smaller blind spot or PDT and prolong the agony a little while. Anti-VEGF changed the world. But when I published Anchor in the New England Journal, this first author and Marina is second, I really thought that within two or three years, we'd figure out a better mousetrap. Like, how do you have something where you have, you know, way less shots and get this amazing results without? Here we are, you know, 20 years later, a Flibercept comes along, uh, uh, just a little bit stronger version of the same mousetrap, uh, provides better care, especially for diabetics that have such a high VEGF demand. But we've had those two agents now for 20 and 12 years, respectively. There's been a lot of shots on goal trying to make either more anti-VEGF in the same package, sustain release ideas, uh, and most have worked but had more side effects than what we had with our regular drugs. And our regular drugs, really the only side effect, amazingly, is endophthalmitis. About anywhere from 1 in 3,000 to 1 in 7,000 times we poke a needle in the eye, you get endophthalmitis, and 
and that's not a good thing, but that's pretty good odds. Now we're looking at uh, a couple of new molecules that have been either approved for Risamab, uh, which is a higher molar blockade of VEGF, plus blocking another target, ANCH2. You have eight milligram of Flibercept, uh, which is like the Flibercept you've given 71 million doses worldwide, but four times the dosing to one, treat patients that were hard to treat, but two, by giving you, you know, uh, additional half-lives, you should get, you know, longer duration in every patient. We've also got gene therapy, which we've been working on for 15 years. We're finally seeing some anatomic and visual acuity results that show promise, but the devil's in the details. A lot of them have either variable effect uh, or, or inflammation or, you know, there's all, you know, it's tough to fool mother nature. And uh, we found that uh, it's not as easy as we thought, although there are some uh, steps in the right direction. Uh, we have a phase three trial with Regenex Bio, a subretinal uh, uh, injection of an adenovirus that basically creates a flibercept. Uh, we've got an intravitreal version from Adverum. Uh, uh, interesting, interesting things in the pipeline. Uh, and, and as well, we've got biosimilars who provide you know, what should be an equivalent drug to our original originator drugs at hopefully a lower cost for the entire health system. Amazing. Amazing. So interesting. So are there any, are there ongoing active um, clinical studies now? We like, even as a cornea surgeon, I remember the anchor study um, when it came out, are, are there um, similar studies going on now that you're excited about that you can tell us about that we should look forward to seeing the results of? Sure. You know, I think, uh, you know, I think the Farisimab trial studies that, that were completed uh, that got uh, a drug on the market for Genentech Roche, uh, that was exciting. Uh, 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 those basically every trial leapfrogs the other. In other words, they make you compare against the dosing and comparator. The, uh, uh, that study looks like that you, you may get extended duration. Uh, the ANCH2 may or may not help you. It should. There's ANCH2 production, which is another one of these vasoactive cytokines, especially in RVO and DME. Uh, the studies we don't have the full results are 8 milligram of Flibercept. We have the one-year study. And using a protocol where pretty reasonable on retreatment, maybe not quite as strict as I would do in the clinic, got you know, 80, 90% of the patients to 12 week dosing, that's treatment naive though. And so nobody listens to me when we, we say 12 weeks and every patient that's a monthly injector every month thinks I can go 12 weeks. Drug and anti-VEGF in any drug in the vitreous, it's a bell curve. And what I mean by that is some people clear drug fast. There are some things we know make drugs clear fast. One, myopia, thinner sclera, pseudophagia, uh, liquefied, more liquefied vitreous, PVD, all of those things, if you clear a drug fast, you're going to need more frequent dosing because your half-life is shorter. Patients that get by with every eight or 10 week injections with any of our drugs are relatively lucky and may go even longer with these more, uh, you know, more more molar complex agents. That being said, the ones that go every four weeks probably have a very short half-life clearance. These drugs may let you go every six weeks or five weeks. That doesn't sound like much. It's a disappointment if you think they can all go 12, but it's nine times a year versus 13, which is four less trips, you know, driving through the snow of Halifax or wherever your listeners are listening uh, to get there for their winter appointments. Yeah. That's so um, so important. I mean, I, I practice in a somewhat remote area, and that's exactly what we deal with the repeat uh, visits. Um, David, a question uh, we have in terms of some of the new therapies, and and one that comes to mind is for dry 
macular degeneration. And um, I'll try to say the name correctly, but it, it almost sounds like a good night out in Texas at a um, at a, a Friday Tex-Mex restaurant, Pegse Taco Plan. Um, and I was wondering if you had any uh, any comments on that. Obviously, that has been kind of the the nemesis, right? How do we treat geographic atrophy? What can you tell us about that? I actually like your pronunciation better than the company. They pronounce it Pexi to Coplan. Okay. It sounds more like a or something. Taco plan like is taco. better. I like the taco part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's very interesting. Greg Hageman and uh, uh, Al Edwards and some others figured out that the, the most, uh, uh, the highest association genetically with dry AMD was complement factor H. So we've been blocking complement in different pathways to see could you alter the course of dry macular degeneration. To get a drug approved, though, dry macular degeneration itself is a tough target because many of these patients. 20 years, no wet AMD, no geographic atrophy, maybe some contrast sensitivity and night vision troubles, but it really doesn't affect their driving or reading visual acuity. The FDA agency uh, allowed geographic atrophy progression as an endpoint. And so that's why a bunch of companies uh, uh, tested complement inhibition with different factors in the complement arcade. One reason they choose uh, to be cynical of Asian is if they can get the intellectual property on it and then tie up the money, right? And so some of them were more of a, 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 a long shot, but they thought they could do it. To date, we've had no trials that worked until we got the Pellis Pexita Coplan data. Pexita Coplan is a blocker of the overall complement C3, C5 pathway. Uh, it's injected into the eye. It's a viscous drug, 100 microliters, about double the dose we give for our anti-VEGFs. Uh, at the end of the day, what it showed was that it didn't stop the disease. It didn't reverse the disease, but it slowed that inevitable progression of GA about 20% in the first year, which extended to close to 30% in the second year. That required ongoing dosing. Uh, uh, and... A lot of our patients with wet AMD have the same concomitant problem of dry AMD. There are also those that are losing vision from dry AMD. This drug was approved in the U.S. Uh, and marketed about six weeks ago. So we're giving it in the clinics. Uh, uh, it's, it's interesting. It's a tougher thing to figure out if it works. With wet AMD, people were going blind quickly. And you could see the improvements on OCT and you could see the improvements on visual acuity. This, you can't really see something, you can't really notice that pain is drying slower, right? Or, or whatever, right? You're trying to slow the progression of an inevitable, which is more of a statistical answer. I didn't think we'd get near as many patients interested when I pitched it the way I just did. But most mm -hmm. of them say, yeah, doc, that's what we gotta do, right? Anything, anything for that, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the trial got approved for every four weeks and every eight weeks. The data is a little better every four weeks. Uh, there's a question of whether there's some anterior ischemic optic neuropathy signal. There's more in the monthly. These are old patients. I hope it's just a coincidence. But most of us are pushing more towards the eight week because that wasn't seen in that arm near as much. Uh, it's a 1.7% incidence versus a 0.2% incidence. We'll know when we do a lot more injections in the wild. Uh, but uh, a, a lot of patients are starting on this. I think it's going to be a tough sell for a lot of the provinces in Canada that have limited dollars. It's certainly going to be a tough sell in the EMA in Europe because they to date haven't shown any improvements in visual acuity. Uh, uh, and so... It's really a loss of that, that geographic atrophy area. And it, for example, if the center vision is already gone, how much benefit is it to have a smaller size scotoma? Uh, it's really up to each individual patient, but it's hard to quantify what the value of that is to a population. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, at least it's, it's opening a door for some potential therapies for that, that part yeah, of macular degeneration, right? I'm really hoping it's like the first antibiotics. 
you know, we don't use chloramphenicol anymore. Sulfonamides are a little bit used for urinary tract infections, but you know, the, the quinolones and the, you know, the antibiotics have really progressed and I'm hoping we get the same thing in this. Now that we know that complement blockade works, there are trials of oral agents from Novartis, uh, other pharmaceutical sub-Q injections. Can we block the complement effect, uh, can, you know, safely and prevent this systemically? The complement system is there to fight infections. And so we were concerned all along that we might get more meningitis in the stole population. Uh, we haven't seen that, thank goodness. Uh, but, you know, certainly anytime you block things in the human body that are designed for a purpose, uh, you worry about unintended consequences. We don't see that with injections in the eye. We worry about that a little more with systemic application. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much for that explanation. Ken wants to know what you think. Please send your comments on today's episode or any suggestions you may have for topics or features to communications at cos-sco.ca and we'll try to incorporate them into future episodes. Hi, I'm Dr. Claire Chan. I'm an assistant professor of ophthalmology at the University of Toronto and I listen to the ICANN podcast. David, can you tell us a little bit about, um, I hear patients ask about this um, from time to time, the macula risk genetic test. Are you using this test? What do you think about it? Give us your insights. So you're talking about the test that tests for uh, different gene alleles and vitamins are, are tailored to, the, to what is found. But the difficult thing is that a dry AMD supplement really takes almost tens of thousands of patients, 5,000 at least, over a five-year study to test versus a control. That's what AREDS-1 was. That's what AREDS-2 was. The macular risk profile was done, you know, with subsets of the genetic data from AREDS-1 and AREDS-2, but then hasn't been tested in a prospective manner. So if you look at in the scientific world, you would use that as gener you know, hypothesis generating and then run a 5,000 patient trial and see if you're right, right? See if you can really tailor vitamins to what it takes. Um, you know, the National Eye Institute, Emily Chu and others really didn't think their data was strong enough to support the funding or even application for funding for that trial. I really trust those guys. Uh, I, you know, vitamins are tough. Let me tell you this. So when we designed the first, and it wasn't me, it was Rick Ferris, a great friend of mine, designed the original AREDS-1 trial, none of us thought vitamins worked. And we really did the AREDS-1 trial to prove that it didn't work so we could just stop talking about it. We were absolutely wrong, right? There was a 25% risk reduction. And so they may be right. They may be wrong. We don't have any way of doing it unless they have a major trial. In the United States, uh, the, the, our Medicare funding isn't paying for the test. And so it's not done very well. So. so what do you, in your practice, do you, what do you recommend to your, who do you recommend what to then? In for vitamins? Yeah. yeah. So what I recommend for vitamins is I, I recommend, you know, the Occuvite Preservision AREDS-2 from Bosch and Loam or as close as you can get to it. It kind of irks me that they got the patent on it. And it was a National Eye Institute study that we did in a population and that there can't be a cheap generic alternative. Right. It turns out that you can get one close to it by dropping the zinc a little bit. The zinc's super high. The zinc is probably the thing that causes most people the trouble, especially men with uh, prostatic hypertrophy have a hard time urinating out all the zinc. And so I'm okay. We tested 80 versus 35 in AREDS2. 80 might have been a little better, but not much. So you can get a generic that's got closer to 35. That's not patented. The only thing else that I would recommend is 
we chose 10 milligrams of lutein a day because of cost. Uh, it used to be really expensive, hard to get. Turns out it's way cheaper now. It's it's uh, it's super safe. We see no indication that lutein lutein is probably the safest thing in the vitamin. And so, if you wanted to do anything for extra credit, you would add twenty or thirty or forty of extra lutein uh, plus an A Reds two type vitamin. Main thing is don't smoke. Stop smoking. Get your kids to stop smoking. You can't help the genetics. You can't help getting older. And and for screening, probably the best thing you can do is, uh, you know, I like the the home testing devices sure work, but they're, you know, you have to get, how are you going to get internet hookup to every one of your 80-year-old's houses and make it work, right? There's a lot of logistic issues. Anybody at high risk, I kind of like them just showing up at their optometrist and getting an OCT every three to six months, Right. It's certainly, uh, it's, it's not what you get with everyday home monitoring, uh, but it's certainly better than going a year, two years between exams. So. And so do you recommend those vitamins to your dry AMD patients or all your, like, well, I have a lot of patients on these vitamins, spending lots of money on these vitamins. I would not spend lots of money on it. If you have, if you meet the criteria, in other words, if you have medium drusen, Right. You know, especially if you have a family risk, you should take the vitamins, yeah. right? Okay. 23 and me uh, or whatever, you know, can easily tell you your high risk alleles for complement factor H and arms too. Mm -hmm. I would not start taking that level of vitamins if I had no AMD findings, even if I had all the high risk alleles, because we have no idea what 20 years of that high of zinc does. Mm -hmm. Might interfere with other minerals, you know, absorption like calcium, which you really need for your bones, right? right. Mm -hmm. And I, and I I would recommend you know for the for the younger patients that have family with wet AMD, potentially those that know their high risk allele status, take a multivitamin that's got antioxidants. Right. Take mm -hmm. lutein; it's super safe. Yeah. Don't smoke. You know. Mm -hmm cardiovascular health, all that stuff's good, right? Everything your doctor really tells you to do probably is good for the heart as it is for the retina. Excellent points. And um, very, very understandable even for us as cornea specialists, David. So thank you. <laughs> um, as we get to the closing of the episode, we always like to ask our guests about some of their non-professional life activities. Uh, for example, what are your hobbies, books you're reading, uh, what fills your downtime? As we as we talk to you, I guess, from your ranch in Texas, what, what are those activities that you like doing? Yeah, thank you very much. I'm a fifth generation Texas cattleman. Uh, we raise quarter horses and uh, show heifers for mm. FFA and 4-H kids. Also love to ski, have a house in Telluride, have four kids, had two daughters married last year. And my youngest daughter just got engaged, so I'll be father of the bride the third time, which is really awesome. one of the funnest things you can do in life. It's a great experience. <laughs> Congratulations. Thanks, Congratulations. My second daughter, my first daughter, my oldest daughter went to McGill in Montreal. Oh, really? Yep. She great. was a Francophile. We love Montreal. I got a lot of, I know, I know a lot of the retina guys around Canada. You got great retina specialists. There. Yeah. Uh, you got great health care, and I love your country. So. Oh, excellent. Well, we'll have to get you up there again. <laughs> yeah, we actually, 25 years, we've been going to Lake O'Hara Lodge, which is a lodge in British Columbia right on the, right on the other side of Lake Louise. Uh -huh. It's idyllic, and uh, my kids actually grew, in, grew up knowing Stompin' Tom Connor songs. So. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. Well, thank you so much for giving us some of your time tonight. It was such a pleasure to meet you. And uh, Dr. Rocha and I got to, you know, brush up on our retina knowledge. I'm going to sound really smart in clinic next week. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, no, no problem. The, corn, the dust cover of the retina, it's a very important. You got to keep clear and, and de -sex. I mean, y'all have come a long way. Y'all have done a lot of, you know, there's been innovations. So. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. I can wants to know what you think. Please send your comments on today's episode or any suggestions you may have for topics or features to communications at cos-sco.ca. 
and we'll try to incorporate them into future episodes. Season three of the I Can podcast is brought to you by Bayer Ophthalmology. Thank you for your support. Thank you to the Canadian Ophthalmological Society. The I Can podcast is written and directed by Kim Teitler and produced by John Allaire from Allaire Strategic Works. Thank you.